this this second part of the session it's it's intended for you to to practice and and try to uh, reproduce some of the uh, examples that I will show you and well I will first share my screen um, because I have to show both the some slides and the the Paraver tool so let's go to no, not this. Okay, so I think now you should be able to see my screen. Uh, so yeah, mm, uh, yeah. As I said, uh, I will show the the basics of Paraver. Uh, so we can uh, analyze the trace that is already on your virtual machine. So the idea is to to analyze this trace uh, from different aspects, uh, uh, load balance, communication, and computation. As Mario presented before, uh, these three aspects are very important in a, in a performance analysis. So yeah, Paraver, uh, it's uh, uh, an ideal tool because it allows you to have an uh, and have both a global qualitative perception of the application and also uh, a detailed quantitative analysis of the, the, the application. So uh, you can have first uh, a general view, uh, a visual view, and then you can go in depth in, depth in a particular uh, region that you, that you think it might, it might, must be interesting to, to, to in, investigate further. So uh, this trace is a, a really small trace. Uh, they can be really big. Uh, this uh, trace it's, uh, was got uh, uh, using the Harmony uh, weather forecast model. And uh, the Harmony model was run on the CMWF Cray XC40 system, which is based on, on Intel chips. And, we, we, and it was run using a uh, two 285 MPI processes uh, and disabling uh, OpenMP for uh, to simplify uh, the the hands-on. I think there are... there is an ongoing discussion in the chat. I think or not. Uh, it's not. It's another a question. Uh, okay, so yeah, let's start. Mm. So what is the tray made of? Uh, basically, trace is made of three different files, uh, the PRV file, the PCF, and the draw file. Uh, in this hands-on, uh, the trace is called Harmony 285 and open and peep uh, and PCF. Oops, this should be PRV, sorry. Uh, so the PRV file is uh, the trace file itself because it contains the, the performance events that were recorded uh, by Xtry. Then the PCF file, it's a, it's a metadata uh, file which describes the type of performance events that are contained in the, in the PRV file. Uh, this file is important because it tells you what performance data is in the trace because depending on the extra configuration that you did, you may have uh, different performance events like MPI, uh, puppy counters, OpenMP, whatever. And then there is a third file, the raw file, which contains the, the IDs of the different MPI processes and OpenMP threads if apply all. So as I said, it's important the 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 PCF file because, uh, well, I'll, I will show you what's inside the PCF file. So let's open it. They are just uh, text uh, files. So you can open a PCF file. So you can see that there, there are different, uh, well, sections, for example, the different states that can be the application in idle, running, waiting a message, um, and so on. Also, uh, colors, uh, how they are represented. And there is a very important aspect, which are the, is, 
which are the event type sections. This, uh, the event type, uh, it, it describes what type of performance events we have. For example, uh, we have uh, the event type of, of, well, this number really large. It's, it contains point-to-point -point MPI messages. Then there is also this second type which contain MPI collective communications uh, where you can have different values. Maria, just yeah. a comment. Um, firstly, can you increase the font size a little bit? It's very tiny. Oh, yeah. And secondly, on the bottom, there is still this, you know, little piece note. Yeah, Amax. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Hope it's now better. Okay. So, yeah, uh, there, there are different event types. Uh, in this case, the trace contains MPI events. Uh, and also, uh, there are uh, puppet counters. In this, ca in this case, we have, uh, well, these two first are very important. We, I mean, they are essential. They should be always there, which are the total instructions and the total cycles. Also, uh, we, we got uh, a double precision uh, floating point operations and uh, double precision uh, same thing instructions. Uh, well, also we have uh, L3 cache misses, and well, uh, in this case we we don't have uh, OpenMP events, we don't have uh, user functions because uh, they were not uh, enabled. So yeah, uh, this is important to to keep in mind uh, when you want to analyze the trace to know what's inside the trace because uh, you may want to analyze an aspect that isn't trace so you will not see anything so if we move on uh the first step should be uncompress the guitar file i don't know if in the term in the virtual machine you have a compressed file or not maybe you you already have the trace as i as i have here if it's the case then it's fine and then you should open the, the Paraver application by typing uh, WX Paraver and the ampersand to, to run it in the, back, in the background. And uh, a, Windows a window like this should uh, pop up. Let's, let's try. Okay. So if I think let's go to the chat. Uh, well, I think there is some discussion, but uh, Mario it will interrupt me if there is any question. Uh, feel free to to ask uh, whatever you, you 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 may have in doubt or what. I mean, uh, we will try to find a, a trade-off between a good. Uh, I mean, to to not interrupting continuously the the, the hands-on, but. It also, it's also important to that not that everyone is lost. I mean, so yeah, when we have Paraver uh, open, uh, as Mario talked about uh, in the previously, uh, in in our case the the trace is really small because it must be manageable. But uh, when when we have uh, really big uh, experiments. Uh, or sorry, simulations. The, for example, let's say with 4,000 processes and pair processes, and you take traces for mm, 20 time steps. So you could you could end up having a, a really big uh, trace, like let's say 50 gigabytes. But this is not manageable at all. Uh, a good idea. I mean. The problem is that Paraver, Paraver uh, loads all the trace in the in the main memory of the of the computer. So, uh, if a trace uh, uh, occupies um, 50 bytes, you don't have 50 gigabytes of RAM mem of main memory in your laptop. So, this is not possible. So, a good trade-off is to have uh, g uh, traces uh, le uh, less than one gigabyte of, of size. Uh, to do so, uh, it's important to, 
to cut and filter them. Uh, well, since our trace is not uh, really big, um, it's not necessary, as I said, but I mean, you here you browse your, your trace, in this case, this trace, and you could, for example, I would like to cut the trace and you could specify in percentage of in absolute time uh, where to begin the, the new trace and to finish the trace. Or also you could also specify uh, a subset of the MPA processes. Just let's say I would like to have only the first 10 processes and you could specify here the range. Also, it would be possible to, to filter the trace. Filter the trace means to discard events that you don't think they are really needed. For example, uh, you, want, you want only to keep MPI events. You could go here and say, well, uh, at, you would like to keep the events uh, that I was uh, uh, see in the .pcf file, for example, here. Uh, let's say, I mean, I will, I want, I only want MPI events. So then I would take this value, this event type, copy here. So then I would only generate uh, a trace with M MPI point to point uh, events. Uh, you can also take, I mean, you can discard the communication lines. I mean, uh, this processor sends a message, a point to point message to the another process. You can discard this because this is an information that it's contained contained in a in a trace. Or also you can discard uh, events. But this is a more advanced feature that uh, we can discuss later if you are interested or we have more time. So let's cancel this. And well, uh, the first step in, in, in with Paraver is to load the trace. So to do so, you should go to File, uh, Load Trace, and search for the the trace that you that you have in the virtual machine. It will take some time to to load it because it's just moving the the trace from the uh, the disk to the main memory. Okay, let's go to the chat. Everything is okay. Otherwise, Mario, let me know if I should stop or, or whatever. Uh, then, uh, once you have the trace loaded, you can see you can see that here. Uh, well, the traces you can actually load more than one trace. Uh, then, for each trace, you have a an environment. Let's say an environment that uh, for each trace you can have open different views. Uh, MPI calls, uh, cache misses, uh, and so on. In this case, we have only one trace. And it is possible to unload the trace, of course. Uh, you go, if you go to File, Unload Trace, then you should select the, the trace that, you have, that, you are, that is already loaded. In this case, we have only one trace. But we don't have to unload it now because we are going to work with it. So, well, when we, once we have the, the trace loaded, uh, well, we can start to uh, lo uh, loading different uh, views of different metrics. Uh, there are two ways. Uh, the first one is by a parallel offers uh, an option which are which is called hints. Uh, hints it's very useful because if you don't if you don't really know what's in the trace, uh, what type of performance metrics is in the trace, Hints offers a first, a first uh, an idea, a first idea of what's inside. Uh, basically, Hints uh, it contains uh, the most basic metrics uh, which are in the trace. Uh, there might be more metrics in the trace, but if they are more advanced, they will not appear in Hints. Uh, hints is just to have a, a first uh, view of the of the trace. Then, if we if we want to to have more complex views or 
or, or configurations, uh, I will you I will show you how to to do it, which is using uh, configuration files. So, if we go to hints, uh, there are in this trace we have uh, different uh, three different types of of performance metrics: the puppy counters, which is uh, how hardware metrics, uh, MPI uh, events, uh, and also useful uh, duration. But the useful the useful is regarding the state the different states of the of the execution uh, first of all uh, i recommend you to load the useful duration uh, as mario explained uh, the useful duration is it's showing you when uh, the when an, an mpi processes process it's running along the execution okay so in black uh, it means that uh, the process is not doing anything uh, useful from a computational point of view. So, in black, it means that there it's co it's communicating probably. While when there is color, uh, in, it means that uh, the the MPI process is doing uh, is computing. It must, it must be useful computation or not. That's another story. It depends on the on how was programmed the application, but it's computing. It's computing something. Uh, the the different color means that uh, it's the the color of the of the of the events uh, represents the, the the length the the duration of the of the computation. I mean, uh, every time you you are computing something and you are start to communicating, then you break the the computation let's well i will explain this further in after because i have to show you first the the basics of parallel to to learn to to resize to to do zoom to copy clone etc you probably notice that if you reshape the the size of the window it automatically uh, computes the the the, the view well, this is because uh, each time you change the size of the window, uh, Paraver must render the, the, the view because uh, since uh, we have more information that pixels in your screen, uh, Paraver must uh, render uh, the, the relevant information to show you. Uh, so, in our case, since we, we have a, a very small uh, trace, this is not a problem. Uh, we, we can just move the resize the, the, the window and that's fine. It takes just a very a few seconds or even less. So that's not a problem, but you may have a very big trace uh, which contains a lot of information or even the, the window, the, the type of information that you are showing in the window it's really complex to to compute because with Paraver you can you can have uh, more complex um, views. So the problem is that if you every time you just do like a very small resize, it might take like let's say one minute to to re redraw the, the 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 window. So to avoid that, uh, here in the bottom you can just select. Uh, if you want an automatic redraw or not. If you don't want automatic redraw, you just unselect the option, and then if you resize the, the window, it will not redraw the, 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 the view. So you can have, uh, I mean, you can just move it and will not redraw the, 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 the window. You, then you can force to redraw it by clicking this, this button in the bottom of the Paraver window. But in our case, we can have an automatic redraw because it's, it just takes a few seconds. OK, so let's move to the next uh, slide. So then another, another very important feature is the, it's the zoom because, well, here, uh, what we have? We have a, an harmony time step uh, from the very beginning of the time step to the end, uh, uh, where we have the four different phases. Uh, this big part of here is the the well 
This is the grid point part. This is the spectral part. And here we have the grid point computations. So maybe, uh, as you can see here, maybe we are interested only in this part. So with a, with a mouse, you can just select an area that you may, that you are maybe interested. So just select and, and leave and click the button and you zoom into this area. So you can do it uh, as many times as, as you want. You can also undo, undo the zoom, just right click on the window and undo the, the zoom. So yeah, this, in this way you can uh, navigate into a, a, um, an interesting, an area that you are interested. So then also uh, with this, uh, with this, in this way, you can only uh, zoom into the x axis. This is into the time scale, but you can also uh, navigate in the, in the y axis, in the, 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 the MPA processes. To do so, you just press the control button and while, and you don't, I mean, while keep, while pressing the control button, you can just select a region. So for example, like only this small region. So then, as you can see now, uh, it focus on a, on a subset of MPI processes and a really uh, scale uh, time. So yeah, as you can see here, what it, at the beginning seems uh, to be just a, just a big color indeed, uh, if you have a, a very closed uh, uh, site, you can see that there are more things. I mean, there are small chunks of computation. Why? Because uh, between chunks of computation, this is, for example, this is a chunk, this is a chunk, a chunk. Uh, chunks are periods of time where you don't have any kind of interruption. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Xavier, maybe they yeah. are asking for, for the particular colors to know more in detail. Maybe you can show yeah. how, to, how to show the legend. Yeah, the uh, this is, yeah, I mean, this is not, I will jump to, 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 to this uh, slide. Yeah, you, by right clicking on the window, you can uh, show the info panel. Uh, this uh, option uh, tells you what are the colors, the, the legend of the colors. Basically, the, the colors, uh, when greener, uh, sm uh, smaller the, the chunks are, and when bluer, uh, larger the chunk are. So in this case, uh, let's undo zoom. Okay, so here we can see that, uh, for uh, well, for instance, the, the the orange color it's it represents the the larger chunks. Uh, this uh, in this central area where you have the grid point computations of the of the time step, uh, the orange color it, it says that well, here the processes are doing a very 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 large computation without any kind of interruption. By interruption, it's it's meant to. I mean, uh, you should understand that we don't have any type of MPI communication. I mean, when we at, when we start to execute, while we are uh, computing something, and we start to communicate uh, because we call an MPI function, then uh, we, we have an interruption. We stop doing uh, computation, useful computation from a user perspective. So then. Uh, we have uh, in the in the in the window of the part where we see that there is a a, a cut. I mean the the chunk it stops. So I will show you more in detail here something. Well, to have you an idea, for example, here. Yeah, here we are going uh, along the time. We are doing computation, 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 and here. Uh, here, what we have is that, well, we stop doing computation because we start to uh, to to run an MPI function to to communicate something. 
uh, in to well I will explain this uh, later because uh, well it's interesting to to compare this against an MPI uh, an MPI window but to do so uh, we have to copy we have to load another view well for example but th these basic uh, uh, options uh, I have to explain I have to explain first these basic options to you but for example you could load uh, to if you go to hints MPI MPI calls uh, to load a different view what you have it's the well the the window of the different MPI calls when we call an MPI function so let's go back well uh, regarding the info panel I will I will finish this slide because I'm here now so well uh, and zoom Okay, so in the in the legend in the info panel we have the legend, uh, the meaning of the colors. Remember that these these numbers mean the 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 different length or the duration of the computation of the computational chunks. You also have the 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 time. Uh, in this case, well, uh, the initial time should be well. If you make zoom here, for example. It tells well the timing of these windows. It starts here. It, it finalizes here at this time, and this is the duration. Uh, the duration of this uh, of this zoom uh, takes uh, uh, this uh, amount of microseconds. And also, you can also show, for example, if you double click in in whatever region of the of the window. You can see how which object do you, you select uh, thread 2034 uh, thread uh, 17 it's called thread but uh, since we remember that we don't have open piece everything is MPI so uh, this thread it's equivalent to the to, to the MPI process and also it, you can see the, the click time uh, in which moment we have uh, just clicked the the, the in the window also we have different information like the duration of the chunk here you can we, you can see that uh, since the orange are the largest chunks uh, we can have the the actual time that it took for this thread to uh, in this uh, in this chunk and also you have well different information that now it doesn't really apply because it depends on the on the the view that you have loaded so let's close this okay so yeah, you you can also uh, let's go back here okay so uh oops so well you at, at any moment you can close the the uh, window uh, but they are not really closed they are here so you can recover them at any moment by the just dou double clicking and just uh, open again uh, then there is another interesting interesting option which is uh, the copy and paste uh, well i will close the the info panel but okay you have now two different uh windows uh, but you would like to compare these the useful duration against the the MPI calls, but uh, they are not they cannot be compared because uh, first of all they are they have a different size, then the time scale is different. Uh, you you want to compare apples with apples, but it's not possible. So uh, you can just copy uh, right click on the on the trace that you want to copy the for example i want in this trace to have the size of this trace so i just can just do, uh, right click copy and here i can copy i can sorry i can i can paste different things i can paste the size of the window to to make this size uh, 
be equal like this size. So let's do it, for example, paste, right, right click, paste, size. So now both trace, both windows have the same size. Now I want to have in this trace the same time I like in this trace. By same time, it means that the period of time represented in the window is the same. So here we go to zero to uh, three seconds, 3.3 seconds. So now I want to go from 1.7 seconds to 2.4 seconds. So let's paste the time. Now we have uh, in both in both views we have the same amount of the, the the same period of time. So they are comparable. Also, it's possible to uh, paste other options like the uh, the objects. For example, if we if we if we had a zoom in a subset of processes, for example, like this. We could copy. Uh, let's do a more zoom. Yeah, uh, we can copy the copy and paste the the, the objects. The ob objects remember that are the 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 MPI processes. The objects in the Y scale. So just right click, paste, and objects. So we have we can compare uh, both uh, views. So yeah, uh, these are very useful options. You, we can also paste other uh, aspects like duration. Duration is mm, the amount of time that we have here. Uh, we could start, for example, we could uh, we could have an optimization. One, well, I mean, let, let's imagine that we that we want to compare uh, a, a time step before and after applying an optimization. Uh, we could just have the original time step. Uh, let's let's do it. Okay. Uh, oops. Uh, for example, uh, one one thing: if you want to copy everything to be the same in this trace, you can just paste default. Default, it it pastes different aspects, time, object, size, and so on. So you paste default, and everything is the same. So let's say the, the duration. Let's say in this trace you have uh, no optimization, and you, in this trace you have an optimization. Uh, and let's suppose that in the trace that you have an optimization, it goes faster. So uh, to see uh, how you improve to see visually, to visually see how you improve, how your optimization is improving the time, you can just, for example, copy and paste the, the duration. So what would you see is that uh, now it's, it doesn't make sense because it's the same trace, but maybe you could see that the time step goes from here till here. Uh, maybe you you could have improved the, this time. OK, so. This is a copy and paste. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, there is another interesting option, which is clone. Clone is just to make a, a clone of the of the view that you have. For example, uh, you well, you can do this by right clicking and clone. What you get is just it's the same, the identical view, but in you can well you can see that you now have replicated uh, the same view. Why is this interesting? Well, maybe if you want to uh, start doing another uh, stuff in this trace to compare it against this one, um, the clone functionality, it's interesting when you have a, a basic knowledge of Parallel and you want to start doing, doing more complex things like computing the, the if windows and, and and this kind of things. So yeah, uh, this is the clone, very easy. As I said, then it appears uh, the, the clone uh, window in the in the in the panel in this panel of Paraver. Okay, so 
Another option, very interesting option, it's the, the, the time scale and the semantic scale. Uh, well, ima let's imagine that, um, well, I will close this. To close uh, a window, uh, well, as I said, if you close this window, it doesn't disappear from here. You can open it again by double clicking, but you can actually remove it from here by using the, the delete selected window. So you can select this uh, view, this window, and just remove it. Okay, so then it disappears. So let's imagine that uh, we, we have done uh, a zoom here. Uh, and instead of undoing all the zooms that we, that we have done, you can just uh, fitting the time scale. Uh, with the, the time scale, uh, remember that it's in the y axis, in the, in the x axis, and you can fit time scale, right click, fit time scale. What this option does is to uh, redraw in the, in the window all the time scale that you have in the in the in the trace. Uh, this is the all the, the original. I mean, uh, redraw the, the the trace with all the with the original uh, time scale that we have. And also, there is another interesting option, uh, which is the, the well. It is also possible, although it's not explained in the slides. It is interesting to to do the same. Uh, with the objects a scale. Uh, for example, we could have a zoom like this. And we we want to to fit all the objects. You could do you could do right click, fit objects, and then you have all the MPI processes uh, uh, painted again. Uh, also, we'll do the fit time scale to show all the time scale. Okay. And then there is a, a third interesting option, which is the semantic scale. The semantic scale, it's basically the, the, the color of the, of the trace, the different colors. This is a semantic scale. Uh, well, what happens here is that, uh, well, I will show you the, the info panel. Uh, if we we'll go to colors. Uh, as you can see here, the in the in the color scale in the legend uh, represents chunks which are bigger than this amount of of time. But maybe I'm not I'm interested in having the wall view, not just greater than. I mean to have a a, a closed uh, number. I mean the the top, the the maximum, the ceiling. So uh, you can adjust the the maximum and the minimum in the in this in this scale. The minimum uh, it says well, if it's smaller than 0 0.67, uh, it's represented in this gold color. Uh, yeah, so you can change this by uh, right click, fit semantic scale, and here you can fit uh, the upper and the and the lower uh, numbers or both. If let's let's do it both, fit uh, the maximum and the minimum. Well, what we have here is that now uh, all the colors. I mean, the orange is still there, in, just in case there are bigger numbers, bigger bigger chunks. But now there is no orange at all in the in the plot because now we have a maximum that uh, fits in all the chunks that we have. And also, we have adjusted the minimum. This means that we don't have a, a chunk smaller than 1.23. The, the minimum and maximum that were used previously are default values that may not correspond to, to your trace. Uh, when we fit uh, the, the maximum and the minimum, or both, then we are adjusting uh, the colors of the lesion to the actual maximum and minimum of our trace, not default numbers. And this is interesting. Uh, actually, you may notice that there was a, a warning uh, symbol in this. Let's let's load uh, again this trace. Well, as you can see, there is a warning uh, symbol here, which tells well 
uh, uh, this is out of the scales. I mean, uh, this symbol is, is uh, warning you that uh, the colors of the trace are not well representing your you, the, 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 the numbers of your scale, the, the number of your trace. So uh, you, you can also, the, the, this right option, fit scale, fit semantic scale, fit both, you can actually do it by just clicking this uh, warning symbol. It's the same. It just fits a minimum and maximum. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Then there, this is, is interesting because in, well, we can also show uh, different views. In a trace, you can load uh, the communication lines and the event flags. Uh, let's start with the, oops, let's start with the communication lines. Uh, as I said previously in the cut and filter option, you can have, you can print the, the communication lines uh, when, a, when a process uh, sends a point-to-point -point message to another process, to another MPI process. Uh, well, this is possible to show by uh, going to right-click on the window, view communication lines, and then this will print the communication lines. Uh, maybe this is not the appropriate window, but because this is useful duration, but maybe it's more interesting to, to load the, let's close this one, and use the MPI call uh, window because uh, it makes more sense to, to load the communication lines in an MPI call window because uh, they, uh, I mean, they are, uh, everything is communication. So in this uh, window, we can do right click, view communication lines, and all these yellow, it actually, they are actually uh, lines. Uh, to have a, a clear view of what's going on, uh, we can just zoom, make zoom into a specific area. For example, let's do zoom in this area. Oops, uh, more zoom here. And what you can see is more zoom here or even here. Well, you can see that uh, you have, for example, this process is sending a message and a point-to-point -point message to this process. Or for example, this process, this master process is sending a messages. Let's do a zoom here. Okay, let's do a zoom here. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, if you want to know the colors, remember that you can just open the info panel, right click info panel, colors. And here there are four different colors, black, which means uh, computation, it's outside MPI. And also the, the, the red and, and white uh, represent asynchronous send and receive uh, respectively. So uh, this I send, it's sending a message to this, pro the, this process the process 11, MPI uh, process 11, it's sending a message to this process, uh, let's double click, to the uh, thread, to the MPI process 56. So you can see clearly that there is a line, there is a communication, a point-to-point -point communication from this MPI process to this MPI process. So you can show this by uh, right click, view communication lines. Let's close the communication lines. And then there is another interesting option uh, in, the views, in the view section, which are the event flags. The event flags, uh, it, they can be uh, show, shown uh, by right-clicking, uh, like in the communications line, by using the event flags option. So now, what, what is this? These are, well, what, as, the same, as the name it says, a, a flag. It's a, a flag which uh, marks where it, uh, an event starts and an event finishes. So uh, in, this, in this window, we have MPI events. So here, uh, this flag shows that an MPI event of which is corresponds to a, an MPI com size function uh, starts and uh, stops. So yeah, uh, this option is, is is in my view interesting to to know when uh, an event starts and finishes. 
we might think, well, it's quite obvious that uh, here and here finish uh, starts and finishes uh, uh, an MPI event. Yeah, but uh, remember that now you we have we have made the zoom a very big zoom. So now it's very clear that we have just one event here. But if we had uh, if we had less zoom, we could have uh, a region that it might uh, that a priori it might seem that it's just one event, but actually there could be more events because. Remember that we don't have enough pixels in our screen to represent, to paint, to paint everything what's going on in that piece of time. So to, to explain this, I will fit time scale. So, well, uh, let's go here. Oops. I will do a zoom here. OK, so here a lot of things are going on. So it's here, you, you might think, well, these are just two events, one and one, because uh, they are like two different, two separated events, uh, this thread and this thread, which are MPI weight. But actually, the, the flags uh, are indicating that there are more events that visually might seem. So if you make a zoom here, wow. There are a lot of events, much more events than we thought, not just two uh, MPI, MPI weight events. Uh, remember, two MPI, MPI weight events, it means that there are two calls to, to the MPI weight function. So yeah, here there are a lot of events, uh, plenty of uh, small weights. Uh, this process, MPI process four, is calling a lot of times the MPI weight function. So yeah, the, the, the band flags might be useful to, to know if, if there are more or less events. Okay, so yeah, these two options are really useful to know uh, what's going on. Uh, well, the, the communications to know if we have point-to-point -point communications and the MPA events to know, the event flags to know if we have actually more flag to we have actually more events than, than it might seem. Okay, so uh, we can move to the next slide. Then there is another interesting uh, section in the in the Paraver window, which is called the files and windows window properties. Uh, if we go to this button, the windows properties section it is this button. Well, there are different things. Okay, let's uh, let's explain a little bit what's going on here. Uh, well, first of all, we have a, a summary of what's what's represented and and displayed in this in this window. Uh, well, the the name you can put whatever name you want. Uh, I mean, if you you can change the name, MPA calls um, blah, and then this will update the name here. You can put whatever name you want. I mean, just to if you are doing, you are creating the the if uh, windows, you can just rename them to well. I mean, it's really uh, useful to. I mean, it it's poor. It's a it's a very powerful tool. So you may end up messing things. So yeah, these kind of things are very useful. So then you also have here the the beginning and the ending time of this uh, times of this period of, of time. You also have the, the semantic minimum and maximum. Uh, well, in this case, the minimum and the maximum, uh, 0 and 70, well, actually, each color has Although it has a name, it uh, it also has a value, a, a semantic maximum, well, a, a value between those two numbers. Remember uh, how I mean. If you open this, uh, MPI point to point uh, values. What 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 I've said. Uh, for example, the MPI I receive has a value four. Uh, MPI I send has a value has the value one. So. Uh, 
is this is the semantic scale uh, its name x function which has a name has also value associated so that this is the way how extract uh, records all the uh, performance events so then uh, we are examining uh, well this is our more well for example this is a more advanced feature that I will not I will not explain unless any one of you uh, uh, answers I mean uh, requests it. so the time you need you can uh, here you can see that it is in microseconds you can change the scale uh, the time unit so you can maybe represent it in in milliseconds or uh, in nanoseconds uh, depends on your needs but uh, using microseconds, microseconds it's fine and also there are uh, two other interesting uh, fi uh, fields well the semantic one it's um, as as the as this field it's it's used to compute the if of windows like Mario mentioned in his talk, he briefly mentioned that it's possible to compute the if windows. This is an advanced feature of, of X-Ray, very useful, but uh, I think it's um, we don't have time in to explain this, but if you are interested, you can ask, of course. But there is this filter uh, option, which has two different uh, subsections, the communications and the and the events. The communications basically, uh, well, you can personalize, uh, for example, when you show the, the, the lines, the communication lines, uh, right click, views communication lines, uh, for example, here, and, and a message, the thread five is receiving a message, uh, in which uh, it's uh, related to this MPI way thing. So, uh, well, when we, when we show the communication lines uh, by default it's showing all the communication all the point to point all the point to point communications uh, but you can personalize this you can say maybe i'm only interested um, to show the the messages that goes from the master process to the rest of processes then you could hear communications from instead of all you could say well uh, i would like to go from the master process uh, from equals to the master process uh, let's say one, two, mm, okay, let's fit objects. Let's move this, fit time scale. So, yeah, now we have the, the messages that go from the master processes, which, as you can see, as Mario said in the matrix, uh, connectivity matrix, we have only uh, local uh, communications between neighbors so yeah this makes sense uh, the master process is only sending uh, uh, messages to the to the local neighbors which are close to them close to it so yeah you can play with uh, different things here uh, with the communicator the well with the size the bandwidth and so on uh, this is something I think to to play with it. Uh, it's not. It, it might be boring to start to explain each one of these functionalities. And then there is the event section, which uh, in this window, uh, which events we are showing? Well, uh, we are showing the event types. Remember, event types are this one. This is an event type. Uh, this number represents that uh, represents. Uh, event types of MPI point to point. This event type represents events of MPI collective communication. So here we are saying, well, all the event types between uh, this number and this number uh, show it, show them in this in this plot. So which are these numbers? Well, uh, as you can, you can see here, it's the point to point uh, collective communication. MPI order, which includes the rank, the size, the split, uh, limit, it, and finalize, and so on. So, yeah, uh, we are saying show here, paint here in this window all the event types, all the events of this of this range of types. So yeah, uh, this is some of the concepts that 
uh, it's a very powerful section that allows you to fully customize the, the window. So yeah, uh, let's move on to the next, well, uh, next slide, the info panel is already explained, so we can jump to, uh, to um, this. I think this is the final. No, not yet. Uh, well, okay, so we, it's possible to, to save a, a snapshot of the window. For example, uh, whoops, no. Uh, I'm interested in this view. Uh, for example, I'm just doing a, a, a report. I'm doing a, a presentation of uh, the of the performance analysis of a of an application, and I want to use this plot. So, is it possible to save it by just right clicking and save save image? You can just uh, image uh, save the. You can give it uh, whatever name you want and save it whatever you want, and it will save uh, much of this of the, of this window. So yeah, it's it's interesting. Instead of by just doing a taking a picture of the of the screen or or whatever, you can just directly uh, save uh, an image of uh, of this window. Okay, so as you remember, the first thing that we did after uh, loading the trace was to load uh, one of the default uh, uh, windows. Uh, through the hints uh, option, because as I said, um, hints are very basic metrics and interesting metrics, of course, uh, that are contained in the in our trades. Uh, maybe we want to to load uh, a window, uh, a view, which contains uh, a performance metrics which is not included in the hints because it's not a basic option. So uh, you can do it in a different way which is through loading a configuration file. So a configuration file is a file. Uh, you can see that in the in the in your virtual machine, you also have, uh, besides of the tray, you have a CFGS file, uh, sorry, uh, folder, which contains uh, basic uh, configuration files that are are meant to be used in this in this hands-on. So if you go to CFGs, uh, there are some of co some configuration files. A configuration file it's it's has the the dot CFG uh, uh, extension. So uh, I think that the name it's quite uh, self. I mean, it's quite intuitive, but uh, well, I will in the upcoming slides, I will go through all of these uh, configuration files to explain to you uh, what are they showing. So let's let's start. Well, let's start. Let's continue by uh, loading one of these configuration files. So, of course, uh, uh, these options, these these hints options. Also, uh, uh, in the end, they they what what is doing parallel is to just load a configuration file. I mean, th these are default config files that are uh, intrinsically uh, in uh, contained in in parallel. But at the end, what what these are what these options are doing is to just load a configuration file. Uh, so yeah, it's the the way to work is to load the configuration file. So file go to file load configure and search for the the cfgs uh, whatever you want for example uh, you can also load the mpi call uh, this one MPI call load it takes just uh, just one second and as you can see the this call is the same like this call that i written mpi call blah so Basically, as I said, these uh, hints here are configuration files that are uh, uh, that, that are in, by default in, in parallel. So, okay, uh, this is the normal way. Well, not the normal way. I mean, this, this is the usual way to work. 
by loading configurations. And you can also create, there are uh, a lot of default configurations uh, created for Paraver. Uh, actually, in, in the Paraver folder, in the Paraver installation, I will uh, show this uh, in the bonus section. Uh, when you download Paraver, uh, it also has a default with a lot of CFGs uh, regarding MPI, hardware counters, uh, OpenMP, uh, sampling and many other features which are which are available to to use by the by the users however this is just a, a bunch of uh, configuration files that are quite common to use so but you may desire to to create your own configuration files this is possible but this is uh, an advanced feature that we, we will not cover in this in this hands-on but yeah you you can create because at the end a configuration file you can open it uh if you go to the terminal and open i mean mpi mpi call.cfg just a uh not an xml file i'm sorry uh, it's just a text file which with metadata uh regarding how to what to print how how to how paraver will draw the window so yeah uh it's it's fully cust um, uh, customized you can customize this uh a lot so okay now we have loaded the uh, configuration file so i think we have a lot of we know a lot of things and i think this is the last yeah this is the last slide uh regarding the basic uh Function, the basic functionalities of, of Paraver, it's regarding the, the sessions. Uh, let's, uh, for example, you you might have, after you, are, you have been uh, analyzing a trace and after a while you have created uh, several views. For example, let's, I mean, you have loaded this one, you have loaded uh, maybe this one, blah, 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 blah. You, you end up with a, an environment, let's say, um, let's call it an environment where you have a lot of useful views that you would like to continue using uh, in in another day. So you can just save this session, let's say, uh, to keep working uh, with this uh, environment. So you could just file, go file, save session, and you could uh, save this as a session. Uh, well. You can also, and also, of course, then you can load the session. Uh, I think in your in your virtual machine, uh, besides the trace and the CFG files, you also have the, uh, a session, which is this. Uh, and you can see here, Harmony Trace All CFG Session. This is a, a session that I created for you. What basically does this session is to just load all the CFGs that you have. So, um, you can try to to load it. Uh, I mean, let's clean this. Or oh, no, sorry, let's. Okay, so we want to start. If we want to load a session, uh, yeah, the session what it what it does first. When you load a session, it, it loads the the trace, and then it loads the all the configuration files that will that are associated to that trace. So, well, before loading the session, I will just unload this trace. It's not necessary to just remove these these windows. Mm, you can just unload the the trace, unload trace, okay, and then you are you have an, a clean uh, uh, working space, and you can load the session that I create for you. If you go to file, load session, search for the session of the of the hands-on. Uh, okay, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, and this is um, it has the a session has the session extension. It's quite intuitive, so you can just load the session. Well, as you can see here, first it loads the trace, and then once has loaded the trace, it will load all the configuration files. And now it starts to load all the configuration files. So yeah. Uh, this is very useful if you 
had a, a, a working space that was very that was very interesting for your ongoing uh, performance analysis. Okay, so this is about to finish. Uh, well, uh, as you can see here, these are all the views that uh, you can have that you can load if you use the CFG files, uh, the configuration files included uh, for this hands-on. So, okay, this is yeah, I think this is the last yeah, this is a histogram. Okay, so um, if we go to the to the to the slides, uh, the next slide basically, uh, well, as I said. Uh, so far, I showed you the the basics of Parallel to to know how to use this tool. And uh, from now on, uh, what I will do is to go uh, com uh, one by one uh, with for all these configuration files to to explain you what's going on. So uh, maybe instead of uh, what can I do? Maybe instead of using this uh, loaded session, I will just unload the session. Well, I mean, I mean, unload the trace. Okay. And start from scratch. So maybe uh, I think it's a, it's a good uh, way to for you to practice. Uh, just first of all, load the trace. So this trace of the of the hands on. And then I will start uh, now explaining uh, more in detail uh, what's going on in the, what, I mean, what really represents the useful duration. So yeah, uh, once we have the trace uh, loaded, we can remember that we can open this useful duration view uh, going through useful, useful, hints useful, useful duration, or we can just load the configuration that I prepared for you uh, in uh, that you have in your virtual machine a uh, useful duration here okay so yeah uh, well I will do it a bigger a little bit bigger okay so here uh, as I said uh, this view shows the 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 duration of the different uh, 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 computational chunks. As I said, a computational chunk is a, a period of, it's a, I will, I will do a zoom. Yeah, the uh, chunk is a period of time where a process is, com is doing computation and it's not interrupted to do um, communication, uh, MPA communication. So here, uh, these are different chunks or different size because uh, they are interrupted to do uh, compu uh, to the communication. Uh, this is very interesting to, to compare this trace uh, against the MPI calls. And you will see uh, that both traces are complementary. So let's go to file, uh, load uh, configuration, and load the MPI call uh, configuration. This uh, configuration shows the the different calls to MPI functions. Okay, remember these two windows are not comparable now. Uh, we should copy. Uh, well, we first of all we they should have the same size. They should uh, represent the same period of time, and they should and this one should only show uh, the two first processes instead of all process, MPI processes. So. Right click, copy, and paste. You could, you, well, you, as I said, you can paste each one of these uh, three different aspects time, objects, and size. But remember that you can paste all of them at the same time by uh, doing a default paste. Okay. So, as I said, these two views are complementary. Why? Because when we have, uh, when we have uh, computation, we don't have, I mean, uh, when we have computation, uh, the MPA call doesn't have any kind of 
uh, value, it's black, which means outside the MPI, because we are doing useful computation. Uh, so here, all the when when we have different chunks, it's because uh, the process is it interrupts the computation, the useful computation to do uh, communication. In this case, to call an MPI function. So, yeah, uh, as and I remember, I remember that uh, I said, well, it might seem that you have a, a really large chunk, but it's because we don't have enough pixels in the screen to show everything. So actually, what uh, this this is not a full chunk. Uh, you can plot the view event flux to see that although it might seem that it's a single large chunk, it has some small events. And you, if you can do a zoom, you will see that this chunk actually uh, split in really small chunks. Copy, paste, time. You can see that here there is a bunch of well, there are a lot of MPI I receive and 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 MPI com size uh, and and between uh, computations. So yeah, remember, not always it might seem that is a large chunk. It's a large chunk, but it actually it may contain uh, different things. Xavier. Yeah. Um, Pablo is 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 asking about how you set two processes in particular. How I said, yeah. uh, just doing the the uh, zoom uh, to. Well, I mean, you can do zoom on the time scale, but you can also do zoom in the for the objects for the y axis. Remember to do uh, this kind of zoom, you should press Control. Uh, I will I will do it again for you. I mean, fit objects. OK, so yeah, now I have all the objects and I want to focus on on the two first objects. So I can do uh, con I, I press control at, while I with the with the with the mouse, I just select uh, a region. So. Yeah. And now I can do the same uh, control. I press control and select the two first objects. While I keep. I keep pressing the uh, control uh, button. Yeah. So, uh, well, this act is actually possible to select objects. Uh, right click. If you have a clear idea of what MPA processes you want to uh, study, you can right click uh, select objects. And here you can uh, select which objects do you want to, to see, for example. And, uh, and select all and select process one, two, and three. So, uh, okay, yes, I want to extend this. And now uh, I can, now I have a, a, a view of the three first uh, objects. So yeah, I can copy, paste, default, and now I have uh, two views that are comparable. Okay, so yeah. Uh, if I undo, I, I fit time scale, I fit objects. Uh, oops, sorry, I fit objects. No, ah, be, sorry, I cannot fit objects because I have manually selected uh, which object, objects to, to see. So select objects and I have to select all so that I now I can see all the objects. Uh, I will remove the event flux. So now uh, let's. I, so I want to explain the uh, the idea of the useful duration. Uh, in a useful duration, uh, what we want. I mean, you you have to keep this very simple idea. Uh, the larger. I mean, what we want to have is larger uh, chunks. Uh, when we have larger chunks, it, it's better. When we have shorter chunks, it's it's worse. Because uh, when we have uh, very large chunks, it means that we are not interrupting interrupting the the computation of the of the process. So this is good. Uh, when we have to interrupt the execution to do whatever else, like 
do a, an MPI communication, uh, we are uh, not we are wasting time. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as you, you can see here, uh, for example, this large blue area, which corresponds to the grid point computation phase of the harmony time step, you might see that, well, actually, you might have realized that uh, the the bottom the the process the MPI processes with a, with a higher uh, they have uh, a short uh, they they take less time than the rest of MPI processes. I mean, here you can see that uh, these processes uh, finish uh, their execution earlier than the rest of MPI processes. This is because of the of the algorithm used. Uh, since Harmony is a, a local area model, uh, they have to. They it, this is not a global model, so they have a they have to compute an extend an extend extension zone, and these processes have to treat uh, this extension zone differently. Uh, we compare the rest of processes. So. What's, happen what's happening here is that these processes have a different type of work uh, to compute. So, uh, yeah, this is a load imbalance uh, because they are doing something that finish quite earlier than the rest of processes. And during this time, these processes are doing nothing. So they, they are spending, they are wasting resources and this is not uh, desirable, but yeah. Uh, of course, uh, to solve this, it's not easy at all uh, because to solve this, you have to re re you have to redesign the algorithm to avoid this extension zone. And this is and uh, and when you work with a with one of these models, which are very very complex, uh, it's not affordable to to redesign everything so that you don't have this imbalance. So uh, you should be able to 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 came up with uh, different uh, workarounds, like uh, applying uh, uh, DL, I mean DLB, uh, DLB is uh, dynamic load balancing, where you can you can redistribute data between processes without uh, you, uh, without having knowledge of how to do it. I mean there are different techniques uh, which allows you to do that, but uh, this is not uh, easy to do it. But well, the question here, well, the, the thing here is that uh, you can also plot a histogram of, you can do a histogram of this. Let's go back to the slides. Uh, yeah, this one. So the next slide is regarding the histogram of useful duration. Uh, you can basically uh, generate a histogram of this. You can do it in two different ways. First of all, well, actually three different ways. Uh, go to hints, useful histogram of computing time, but you can do it uh, using the, the configuration file that I provided you, which is called useful duration uh, histogram. If you open this configuration file, uh, then you will, you will see, uh, this is a visual way and this is an, an, an analytical way here. Uh, the chunks are distributed uh, according to its duration. So, uh, as you can see here, this uh, remember that Mario said uh, it's it's better to have a straight lines. Uh, vertical lines should be very well aligned. When they are aligned, when they when they are aligned, it means that it's well balanced. The work is balanced. So. When you don't have uh, aligned lines, it means that you have workload imbalances. And specifically, you can see these chunks, which corresponds to these to these chunks. All this region, uh, uh, note that uh, the, these these are the larger chunks. So, because uh, the x-axis represents the time, these larger chunks, which corresponds to this part, uh, they are not uh, balanced at all. So you have a very, very heavy uh, workload imbalance, especially for these processes. So uh, with a histogram, you can analytic, 
uh, determine that you have a workload imbalance. There are different ways to, I mean, then you should, the next step should be why we have a work imbalance, uh, a workload imbalance. Well, there might be different reasons. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to, to cover this, but because we then should start to do more advanced tricks to, to determine what's going on. Uh, but for example, we could have that a work, I mean, there, there are different types of work, workload imbalance. For example, maybe uh, what we have a preemption. Uh, what is a preemption? A preemption is that when the operating system needs to execute a process uh, service um, so that it just removes your process from the CPU and it puts uh, a daemon, a, a service in the CPU to run, I mean, for example, whatever thing, for example, the 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 network driver or whatever so when we when this happens then what we observe is that one process it takes more time because uh it was removed from the cpu so that it it it, it there was a period of time that the cpu was doing other stuff which is not related to your application so this kind of things sh should be uh, analyzed uh, using more advanced uh views like uh, the IPC because uh, when your process has a when the IPC of a specific process of a specific CPU it's a slowdown it's because something nasty has happened and it is and probably it's because the the well the operating system has has removed your process to execute a service or for example uh, it could also happen that there is a the a slowdown in the frequency uh, when the when the hardware detects that the you, the the temperature of your CPU is increasingly is increasing and it can damage the CPU it with it slows it automatically slows down the, the frequency so when that happens uh, your process your specific uh, process will take more time so there might be uh, a, a subset of of MPI processes which take longer because in that node the CPU has the CPU has suffered a, a slowdown in the frequency. So these kind of things, uh, it, it's it's, it's uh, there. There are things that must be taken into account, or or simply because uh, like in this in this application in Harmony, uh, this uh, workload imbalance it's because of the of the of the application, the, the design of the algorithm. Uh, basically, as I said, uh, it's a local area model. You have an extension zone, so you have that extension zone differently from the rest of processes. So then you have, if if you treat them differently, you have different amount of work. So that's what happens. And also, there is a, a workload imbalance between uh, these processes, not just these ones that are in, in charge of the extension zone, but between these processes. Uh, this might be caused to different uh, uh, to different uh, problems. Uh, for example, uh, it's very typical that in, in weather models, uh, you have uh, workload imbalances to the physics, to the microphysics of the, of, the, of the application, because if you have to compute uh, clouds, I mean, uh, you don't have clouds everywhere. You might have clouds on some specific area of the grid, but not in another area. So the processes processes that don't have to compute clouds will take more it will take less time than the processes that have to compute clouds. So there is a, a an imbalance that you cannot avoid. I mean, it's it's very difficult to, to avoid these situations. Like in in the radiation, you only have radiation in half of the year. Uh, the other half is it doesn't have radiation because it's night. So yeah, uh, low uh, balances uh, it's a very important aspect that uh, can determine the, the the efficiency of your code. So let's move on to the next uh, slide to the MPI calls uh, that actually I already loaded because I I thought it was useful to compare it against the MPI. The MPA useful duration. And also, uh, the next slide is the MPI profile. Uh, the MPI profile, it's basically 
Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention something. I said there are three different ways to load this histogram. Well, uh, using the configuration file, using the hints, or you can actually uh, compute your own histogram. This is more advanced, advanced feature that uh, you can do it, for example, in uh, with this button, new histogram, you can just press this button and it will, I mean, the, the options by default are okay. Uh, you can do really complex things, but I think it's, it, it's okay. I, I think I, if I remember well, it's okay. So yeah, uh, you have the same histogram, copy, paste, size. So it's, it's actually the same histogram. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can compute uh, histograms by, uh, well, here you could change different options, uh, the control timeline and the, and the data timeline, but uh, I don't have time to, to uh, talk about this, I'm sorry. So yeah, if we go back to, to the MPI call, uh, let's hit time scale, uh, hit objects. Oops, no, select objects, select all. Okay, so uh, yeah, as I said, uh, here you have, you might, you might say, well, uh, here, uh, these processes, uh, you, you can blame the MPI because the, these processes are spending a lot of time doing an MPI weight ID, uh, but actually, as I told you, this is not because of MPI. This is because of your your application, which has an imbalance. So, uh, or for example, here in this area, you may say, well, I have an MPI all to all, which takes a lot of time. Well, it's not because of the MPI all to all. It's because of, it's because of you have a, a workload imbalance. And until all finishes doesn't finish their work, this uh, all to all cannot be performed. So. Actually, the duration of the MPA all to all, it's just this period, this period of time, because here they, okay, they start to execute the MPI all to all, to all but they have to wait until all the processes arrive to the MPI all to all. So uh, it might, you might think, well, this is because of MPI. No, this is not because of the MPI. Sometimes it might happen because they are, well, depends on how the, the installation of MPR in your machine uh, behaves. I mean, if it, it has a good performance or not, but uh, in this case, it's because of the workload imbalance. So yeah, as I said, then you can compute, uh, this is a, a, a visual uh, perspective of MPI, but you can also have a, a qualitative uh, um, aspect of, of MPI, like this histogram. This is possible by uh, using the uh, specific load configuration, uh, MPI stat, which computes uh, an MPI profile. So if you load the, if you load this uh, MPI stats.cfg, it shows the MPI profi profile, which also allows you to, to know the load balance, parallel efficiency, and, and other things, things. So, well, it loads a, a, a profile which tells you well, uh, in average, uh, seven to almost seventy-three percent of your time it's uh, doing useful computation. It's outside MPI, so it's a useful computation. Mm, well, you, this is not. I think uh, I would say this is not a good execution, uh, a good efficiency because. Uh, mm, you are spending a lot of time doing a stuff which is not a computation. And as Mario said, uh, or uh, highlighted in, in the previous talk, uh, well, in this case, there are two, uh, in average, there are two different uh, functions. In this case, the MPI all to all, which takes almost 15% of the execution time, and the MPI weight any, which takes almost 9%. And this is not because of the, as I previously said, because of the 
and because of MPI. It's because of the load imbalance. So yeah, be careful uh, before blaming MPI that uh, there might be another reason of the load of the low efficiency. So yeah, uh, as Mario said, uh, in this plot, uh, there are interesting things like uh, this number, the the edge, the almost 70%. This is the parallel efficiency. Uh, then we have the, the, the maximum, this value, it's the communication efficiency, uh, which it's quite good. Uh, I mean, this, this shows that the, no, well, not quite good, but it's not bad. Let's say it's not bad. So the, in general, uh, the Cray, that ECM, the ECM, the ECM that we have machine has a, a good uh, interconnection network. And then the, the average maximum is value, the 0 0.87, it's the, it's the low balance. Uh, well, the low balance is not, I cannot say it's bad, it's not really bad, but it's not good. Uh, I mean, we, we, as you can see, there is, oops. Uh, the, the balance is not good, as you can see here. So, yeah. I mean, uh, using this table, you this table and this ju with just these four four plots, you can get a lot of useful information. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, uh, regarding the, the useful instructions, uh, in this plot, I uh, you should load the useful instructions.cfg configuration file. File load, conf load configuration useful instructions. So uh, I will do it bigger, based uh, size. I will close this one, this one, and maybe uh, not yet. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so here uh, this plot uh, shows how many instructions uh, have been executed. As you can see, the numbers are in are incredibly large, uh, five millions or no, and five millions. So, uh, yeah, uh, here you can see the difference in number of instructions that between those processes and those processes, the the from three point eight to, uh, for example, six five. So yeah, it's obvious, it's obvious that the amount of work to execute is quite different. So yeah, well, I mean, the, this uh, in view per se, it's not really useful. It's useful when it's uh, used to derive, uh, for derive uh, uh, windows. For example, uh, when you want to compute, uh, as you will see in the upcoming uh, slides, that you want to compute the the number of cache misses per thousand instructions. Then you you can use this metric, this window, to compute uh, this new derive metric. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this the, the IPC. The IPC is a very important uh, metric. Uh, there are two two configuration files regarding the IPC, the useful IPC, and the aggregated useful IPC, which basically as Mario explained, this, this is an average, this is the average of the aggregated uh, IPC of all processes to have an ideal and a general idea of, of the IPC of your application. So let's load these two configuration files. The uh, useful IPC. Okay, let's paste the size. To This to here, and then the let's load the aggregated uh, just like we see. Okay, so let's paste the size. Okay, so here you can see that um, depending on the region, we have a higher or a, or a lower IPC. Uh, in general, 
it's not uh, well it's not bad but it's not good i mean uh especially in this in this part in the spectral computation the the ipc is not good it's quite low and as you can see it's around mm, 0 0.5 uh, this is a poor ipc however in the grid point computation phase the ipc around 1.3 it's quite good uh, however in these areas the ipc is really good uh, it's close to two so that that could be a high pc however keep in mind that you might think well if you have a, a high ipc you have a, a good performance mm, yes and no depends depends on on different things for example you can have a high pc but because you are executing i mean the ipc it's it's instructions per cycle which type of instructions all instructions so uh what you are really to, for to have a good performance you want to have a ipc a high ipc for computing instructions uh if you have a high ipc for instructions that which are instructions of control like uh, branches jumps uh comparisons uh these kind of instructions which are of con control instructions they they may increase the average of your ipc but they are not useful at all from a, a computational point of view so uh, I'm, I'm saying this because uh yeah i will load uh, another interesting uh, i will jump to first to the l3 cache misses so let's in the l3 cache misses we have two different configuration files one is uh the the, the ratio between l3 cache misses and thousand instructions per thousand instructions sorry and this is the uh, average aggregated value so if we load these two numbers the sorry these two configuration uh, uh, files mm -hmm. okay let's paste the size and then also load uh, the aggregated uh, configuration which is this one so paste size okay so yeah uh, it's yeah now okay so uh in this plot in this window what we see is that well we have almost six uh after cache misses per thousand instructions so this is not a high value actually this is quite right it's a good uh it's a reasonable amount of cache misses uh, as you can see here in this spectral part we can we can have actually a very high ratio uh 64 uh after cache misses per thousand instructions which is i think it's quite it's quite high because take into account uh, keep in mind that uh an l cache miss it's quite expensive because you have to go to main memory and go back to to, to bring the 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 valid data so uh what i wanted to remark between these two uh windows is that well uh note that there is a correlation between uh okay let's, let's compare these two you see well i have a, a high ipc i, I mean it's, this is important to to understand what's happening uh why we have a high ipc in the this grid the grid point area because we have a we don't have many cache misses uh so since we don't have a lot of cache misses we have a, we can have a high ipc because the the processor is not stalled However, in the spectral area, in the spectral, uh, yeah, the spectral area, the we have quite more uh, cache misses compared to this, so the IPC is slower. Is sorry, is lower. So, yeah, I mean, the, here these two plots uh, suggest that uh, there is a correlation between the IPC and the and the cache misses but this is not enough i mean um, there there must be other reasons and 
it's difficult to, to explain in, in just a few minutes uh, what's happening. But uh, the, the, the big idea, the, the big idea here is that uh, keep in mind that, yeah, most of the times there is a, a, a almost direct correlation between uh, cache misses and IPC, especially if your code is, is uh, well, is uh, doing a lot of computation. So another interesting uh, slide is uh, uh, never flops, uh, the billion of floating point operations per, per second. Uh, again, there are two uh, configuration files, the useful and flops and the aggregated, aggregated version. Let's load those two uh, configuration files, the useful and flops. Let's paste the size. And then uh, let's load the aggregated version. OK. Let's paste the sums. OK. So as you can see here in this, in this uh, plot, uh, you may see that, well, uh, taking into account that uh, this this area, as I said, is a grid point computation area. So there are no, uh, in this area, what we are basically doing is computation. But as you can see here, uh, the envelopes is not really high. The number of uh, um, floating point operations per second, it's not very high compared to other regions. For example, in this region, we have, well, more, more than 2,000. So we are quite far of having a good, a good peak of end flops. Uh, uh, for example, the spectral part, it's quite higher compared, it's quite high compared to the grid point part. So, uh, well, uh, we say uh, we have a high, in this area we have, uh, okay, let's take, this aggregate, okay. Mm, yeah, okay. In the grid point area, we have a, a, a high IPC, we have a low cache misses, but however, we have a, a very, not the, the envelope is not high. So, well, you might think, why we have a, a high IPC and a, a low cache misses and we don't have a lot of cache misses, we don't have a, a high number of envelopes. Well, because probably in this area, this high IPC comes from other reasons, like we are executing other control instructions, like uh, instructions uh, of uh, branch instructions, uh, comparison, uh, jumps, um, uh, in integral uh, operations. Um, so, uh, one of the uh, ideas that we had when we analyzed this application is that in this area, in the grid point area, uh, the, the code is designed in a way that uh, there's a lot of user functions. We are calling a lot of user functions. So the granularity of, of, of computation time spent in each user function is very small. So what happens that since we are calling a lot of user functions, each time that you call a user functions, you have to execute some control executions because you have to uh, 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 put in the stack the state of the registers and well, this is uh, microarchitecture stuff that this takes, this, this adds time to your execution. So uh, yeah, these instructions, yeah, but this is a lot of instructions and since this instruction, this, this kind of instructions, control instructions doesn't fail, doesn't cause a, a miss in the cache, uh, it will increase the, the IPC because they are instructions and you don't, and you will, you won't have a, a high uh, cache miss ratio. So what happens is that you have a, it might seem that you have a, a good performance, but the mega flops, the flops doesn't tell you, doesn't tell this to you. So yeah, that's the reason that we are doing other kind of, uh, uh, you are executing other kind of instructions that not, 
that, that they are not useful to your computation. So this kind of thing is, uh, uh, it's not easy to, to, to see. I mean, you have to, with the, with the windows that I showed you, this is not possible to, to, the, to, to arrive to this conclusion because you have to uh, use other windows, but it's, I, I'm just giving hints and tips because keep in mind that uh, sometimes uh, there might be other reasons why don't you have a, a good performance. So yeah, uh, uh, these are, um, I mean, there there are different ways to, to determine this kind of, of things, but uh, for example, um, uh, there are ways to uh, to determine if uh, your mem your application is computer memory bound, uh, doing tests of uh, filling the half of the cores or um, these kind of things. So, and the last slide I think, yeah, is the vectorization efficiency. Uh, well. Another important aspect in, in high performance computing, uh, it's, it's regarding the vectorization of the code. Since uh, we are using uh, machines that have vector instructions, which what a vector instruction basically does is to compute uh, with one single instructions, uh, replicate the same operation. Uh, for example, uh, it's possible to, with a single instruction, uh, uh, double precision simple instruction, a vectorization instruction to do, for example, four uh, adds or four multiplications. So, uh, well, uh, this is possible to, to determine by using these two configuration files, the, the double precision vectorization ratio and the aggregated one. I will load them and I will try to explain more in detail what are these two kind of, these two configuration files. So, uh, use one, this one. I will clean a little bit my workspace. Okay, so I will paste the size and then I will load the aggregated. Yeah, here, there, this one. Paste size okay so oops uh, well mm, in this in this configuration file we are computing uh, the vectorization efficiency what is the vectorization efficiency for example a vectorized uh, when a code is not vectorized it means that uh, the compiler is generating code so that uh, one single uh, floating point open is executed in a single instruction. So one floating point operation, one single instruction. The efficiency is one. Uh, this is a not non-vectorized code. Uh, since we are using uh, uh, a road well, a road well architecture, I mean. Uh, the Cray machine of ECM and OEF uh, uses Intel sheets uh, based on uh, Broadwell, Broadwell architecture. This architecture has a 255 uh, bit wide uh, registers. So uh, you can compute at the same time uh, at, at most a four uh, floating point, double floating point operations. So the, the efficiency can be at, at most four. Uh, an efficiency of four, which means that we are with a single simple instructions, we are performing four floating point operations. So, uh, well, as you can see here in this part, uh, we we have just a number of one because this means no vectorization at all is applied. And regarding the spectral part, for example, it's almost three. Well, mm, in average, uh, we are performing almost three uh, floating point operations per simple instructions. This is quite good because take into account that uh, not always it's possible to vectorize the code. Uh, the compiler, in order to uh, vectorize a loop, it has to be able to 
well to manage dependencies and these kind of things and if not if it's not uh written in a way that the compiler understands it if the compiler will not uh, vectorize it so but let's go to the interesting part to the to the big point area uh, where we have uh, a vectorization efficiency of 1.30 uh this vectorization is not good at all because uh taking yeah. into account that yeah so so it's, it, sorry, it, it seems that we have to to close maybe in four minutes or something like that because it's time for lunch. So maybe you can you can move in, uh, finish the session. Uh, well, like the, the last words. Uh, yes, I'm about to finish. Uh, the, this was the last slide. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, basically, uh, the thing is that uh, most of the time of our time step, this is the the goal execution of the application, is spanning this grid point area. If the, if this grid point area uh, is not well vectorized, the performance of our application is not cannot be very good. I mean, uh, the vectorization is really good. Uh, in, in order to have it's i mean the vectorization is very useful and very important to have a good uh, a good performance so uh, uh this application uh compiled with gcc uh doesn't seem to have a, a good vectorization there might be different reasons to this uh we we didn't explore more of this uh more in detail what's what's the reason of this but i mean uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's very important to to have a well vectorized code, and with Paraver, uh, with this kind of configuration, it's very easy to to understand to see that the vectorization is not good at all. And yet, yeah, to to summarize, uh, this is just a bonus slide that well, in the in the folder of Paraver that you have installed in your virtual machine, there is a, uh, a C, as I mentioned earlier. There is a, a folder with a different CFGs that are by default included with the Paraver uh, installation that you can, if you are feeling encouraged, you can use them to, to play and to test different things. But keep in mind that, as I said, this trace has limited uh, performance metrics and not, and not all the configuration files may work. Uh, basically, if you try to load the configuration that it's that is trying to use a performance metric that is not included in the in the trace, it will warn you that, well, you are trying to load a configuration that has no performance events. So yeah, uh, to conclude, um, as, you, as you can see, uh, Paraver is a very powerful tool that you can do a lot of different things. Uh, you can, for example, uh, do the if uh, windows that I didn't explain anything regarding this how to do it I, I mentioned it but i didn't explain it because it could take a lot of time but yeah i mean uh one of the things of paraver is that uh it it i encourage you if you are interested in paraver you 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 try and try an error you try things you you play with it because most of the things you you end up learning by yourself or of course um we, you can ask uh, uh to us whatever you whatever question or whatever problem you may have or even the the bsc team the bsc tools team uh that would be uh, happy to to help you so i think uh with this we can conclude this session here uh, as mario said uh we are running out of time 